Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Dennis Hayes, president and CEO of the Bullet Foundation. Hayes, an environmental activist, rose to prominence in 1970 as the national coordinator of the first Earth Day when he was 25. During the Carter administration, Hayes directed the Federal National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He has been a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center, a senior fellow at the World Watch Institute, an adjunct professor of engineering at Stanford University, and a Silicon Valley lawyer. Internationally, Hayes is recognized for expanding Earth Day to more than 180 nations. It is now the world's most widely observed secular holiday. Hayes has received numerous honors, including the National Jefferson Medal for Outstanding Public Service, as well as the highest awards bestowed by the Sierra Club, the National Wildlife Fight Federation, the Natural Resources Council of America, and the Commonwealth Club, among others. Hayes has served on dozens of governing boards, including those of Stanford University, the World Resources Institute, the Federation of American Scientists, the Energy Foundation, Children Now, Greenpeace, and the Environmental Grantmakers Association. He continues to chair the board of the International Earth Day Network. On February 24, 2010, Hayes gave a talk entitled, Is Prosperity Incompatible with Posterity? This was the Oregon Humanities Center 2009-2010 Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities. Dennis, welcome to UO Today. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, what an incredible introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, and that was much shorter than it could have been. <laughs> it's quite an, uh, yeah. an incredible file. Thanks for coming because there's so much to talk about. I wanted to ask you to start with um, a few words about the Bullet Foundation and what its mandate is. The Bullet Foundation was set up on the death of Dorothy Bullet, who was an entrepreneur who built a, a, a broadcasting empire in the Pacific Northwest. And it operates where the signal of King Broadcasting used to be, Washington, Oregon. In Oregon, it was KGW uh, or KGO. And I wasn't there in the broadcasting days. Um, and um, Idaho, Montana, British Columbia, and southeastern Alaska. And although our mission has gone through a series of adjustments, at the moment we are at the interface of human beings and nature. There are a number of foundations who make their grants in ways that um, the further away you are from the nearest human community, the more likely they are to fund you. It's, it's really about wilderness things and, and endangered species, timber, marine areas. Ours is about urban ecology, industrial ecology, the services that nature provides for people. It must be very hard to narrow your focus when there is such a huge range of things a foundation like yours could take on. Mm -hmm. You s talk about it as having evolved, and I know one of the things that's particular about the Bullet Foundation is that you work within that circumscribed geographical area. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the term Cascadia? Is that a term <laughs> you use to describe it? Uh, sure. There, there are a number of these uh, terms that are sometimes used for the region. Um, in including Ecotopia, when there was a, a novel about actually having it split off from the United States. But at least as we use the term, it's, it's really Washington, Oregon, and, and the western part of British Columbia, the, the areas that flank the Cascades. We go more broadly than that. We go into the Rocky Mountains and further east. But Cascadia is, is typically just that band of western states. And in fact, although my board has a very strong aversion to crossing the boundary into California. Uh, once you get down in the Siskiyous, it's pretty difficult not to get, it's all one coherent ecosystem. But we do not fund you if you're in California, just because there is so very much money there already, and we want to husband our, our relatively scarce funds. But you do include Alaska in some of this, do you not? We do. Yeah. Not as part of Cascadia, but, <laughs> but <laughs> as part of our program. I see. Yeah, I understand. You said um, earlier that you work on the interface between human beings and nature, mm -hmm. and that indicates um, that you want to deal with areas where there is a considerable human population. So you focus some of your attention on cities in particular? Yes. Um, we, we will deal not only with the major population centers, if there's something that's particularly innovative going on somewhere else that we think has broad applicability. But in, in some large measure, possibly um, um, in, a, in a way that is difficult to justify, 
we like to think of what we're doing in this part of the world as, as creating a model for the rest of the world as it tries to negotiate its way into a sustainable future. Uh, the, the Pacific Northwest of this country and British Columbia are remarkably well educated. They're remarkably green. They're quite politically progressive. They're, I mean, Oregon's whole history is one of taking bold stances on issue after issue. And, and we would like this part to really pioneer a bunch of things. So we have in Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver probably the three greenest cities in North America at a time when the world is moving into cities. Uh, the rural populations are all uh, either drifting or stampeding into cities around the world, and many of them are sort of unlivable. They're looking for things that work in an era of constrained resources, and uh, we'd like to build some models that can be broadly replicated. Because of the breadth of what you might be involved in and because of the number of applicants you must have for, for some of your resources, I expect that you, um, it must be hard to choose what you're going to support. On your website, one of the terms that comes up more than once is that you want to catalyze. You want to be a catalyst. Can mm -hmm. you explain how you forward the kind of projects you want to promote? Sure. Uh, I mean, catalysis in, in chemical terms is, is something that speeds up a reaction that would occur anyway, but it occurs much more rapidly in the presence of the catalyst. I, I suppose what we were thinking is that we are definitely entering into an era that will be constrained by the ability to pour carbon into the atmosphere, constrained by what's going on with increasing water scarcity, uh, constrained by uh, limits going into agricultural uh, lands, both from water, from uh, soil loss, and, and from increased heat and, and what have you. And in that kind of an era, a series of changes will necessarily come to industry and to cities. For, uh, I'll, I'll go on this little toot for a minute or two, if I may. Uh, the, the whole world, including the humans on it, for a very long time was governed by a series of principles of ecology. Uh, and what lay behind most of those principles for how things would act and interact was that energy was scarce and in the currency of energy, expensive. That's to say, it, it took a lot of energy to capture some energy because the energy that everything had, with the exception of a little bit of wind and some rainfall, was, was energy that you got from the sun if, if you're a plant and from eating those plants if you're an animal. It, it wasn't until uh, the steam engine that um, we began to make use of something that was really dense and that was the sun's energy from 200 million years earlier. Until that time, it was draft animals and sailing vessels and, and just an enormous amount of hard work by people. We designed most of European cities during that time and a number of Asian cities as well. And, uh, and they worked reasonably well. In fact, many of those European cities are still incredibly good and even rather environmentally sensible places, despite the fact that we had all of this dense energy that you could do other things with that could have interrupted that process and, and created the way that America built its cities. If we're now getting back into something where that energy will be more diffuse, will be more expensive, will be more scarce, it will result in changes in cities as well. And we're trying to anticipate what those would be and figure out how to make them much more attractive so that we come out the far end of this industrial revolution having made a great leap forward into a new thing. And that is one of your emphases, I believe, is that you want to be proactive as opposed to putting Band-Aids on symptoms? Uh, yes, we, we, we want to find things that work or attempt things that might work, and then if they do, uh, get more of it, and if they don't, abandon it and try something else. I mean, foundations are really quite wonderful organisms in that um, they do have this opportunity to try things where it's not clear that this is going to be successful um, in, in ways that it's difficult to do if you are a publicly traded company accountable to your shareholders. We don't have to worry about a bottom line. So we are, for example, building a building in downtown Seattle that will be six stories tall that gets, on an annualized basis, as much energy from the electricity generated by photovoltaic panels on its roof as it uses for all purposes. If you spent much time in Seattle, you don't, we don't get that much sun. Um, and to do that for a six-story building means you harvest every kilowatt hour you possibly can, but also that you have to be incredibly efficient on everything that's inside. Um, we will be using roughly half as much energy as a lead platinum building. So that means you're pushing the frontiers a bit. 
You want to use the best available building materials, exquisite design, things that cause people to even change their behavior a little bit. I, I have been constantly pressing the architects to make our elevators, which are required and they need to be accessible for people who have uh, disabilities or what have you, but they should not be there and enticing is the first thing you see when you walk in the door. The, the f you you want to have um, uh, what we call the irresistible stairway. That you walk in the front door and you'll be just pulled up to whatever your floor is. It, it'll be better for people's waistlines, better for their cardiovascular health, and, and much better for our energy bills. Um, I even at one time was trying to make the case that we should put bagpipe music in the elevator, <laughs> anything to get people out of that stairway. A and across the board, for example, when you leave your office at the end of the night, the last person to leave the office in a typical office building uh, will turn on the burglar alarm. So we'll design it so when you punch in the numbers on your burglar alarm, it shuts off all electricity inside. There will be no vampire losses, parasitic losses from machines that have been put to sleep instead of having been turned off. And the first person that comes in the next day punches in the code on the burglar alarm, the electricity goes on. It's all of these kinds of little things that added together really pair a lot of energy off the bill without losing anything. So if you manage to institute all of that in one particular model building, then of course the principle is that they could be easily adopted by other future projects, right? Entirely. I mean, it, it makes no sense for us to do this building because we have a, a grandfathered lease where our current offices cost us basically nothing. It's, it's, it's a rounding error in our budget. But we want to do this because our current offices are in a, a carriage house that Dorothy Bullitt's house that she grew up in was attached to. And so my office is in the hayloft. Um, the hay never complained about the fact that there was no insulation. And because it's historically protected, you can't put all kinds of new things in it. So to warm myself, the only option that I have is electrical resistance heating. So I'm the head of an environmental foundation with an electrical resistance heater in an uninsulated upper story building in the middle of winter. And it, it's not communicating what we want to communicate about it. But it's comfortable enough to work in if I wear a coat in the winter. And, um, and it's got great character. But we're not so much about character as building something that is ultimately sustainable. It makes a lot of sense that as a figurehead foundation and you as a figurehead in the movement, you should be working and living in a model environment. So that yeah. can see why you have justified the building of the, this new space. Yeah, and, and, and it will also have to make economic sense because we will be using one half of one floor of a six-story building. We have to lease the other floors, and uh, that means we have to do it in a way that people are prepared to live with. And, and interestingly, we are almost certainly going to be leasing two floors to the architectural firm that designed us and one floor to the general contractor that's constructing us. So we've got everybody's interest lined up to make this building affordable, and yet really works and achieves its objectives. It means that they get to use it as a model space as well, I suppose. In fact, that's yeah. precisely it. It becomes sort of their new pamphlet, their brochure to show what they can do. Speaking of how you present the Bullet Foundation to the world, I wanted to get back to what I thought was really interesting and provocative use of a kind of economic terminology on the site. You, the, one of the quotations I picked up is, the human economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the natural environment. Mm -hmm. You're obviously using language that is designed to appeal to the kinds of units in the economy that you are hoping to bring on board. Is that right? Oh, in, indeed. Uh, and we're also just trying to speak the truth. Uh, if, if, if you look at the services that are provided by nature to, to humankind, um, there are just a huge number of things that take place in the natural environment from uh, producing fish in the open seas that we catch and eat. I mean, we, we charge for the vessels that go out there and get them. We pay laborers to do it, but, but the fish themselves are free. It's presented to us by nature. Um, we don't live very long without oxygen. We have all these boreal forests and tropical rainforests that are acting as the great lungs of the earth and spitting out the oxygen that nobody pays for. And hence, if somebody cuts them down, there is no cost on anybody's financial ledger for the fact that that's not happening anymore. Or the protection that's provided by wetlands or the cleansing up of, of sewage and stuff by wetlands through natural processes. There was a study oh, a decade ago or so by a distinguished group of economists that lifted from refereed economic articles the, 
the, the attributed value to 16 or 17 basic natural services provided by nature. And um, it was valued, they, they, the minimum valuation they thought for this would be $33 trillion. And that was at a time when the gross domestic product of the world was about 18 or $19 trillion. So the things that we're not paying any attention to at all when we're making our investment decisions are actually worth maybe twice as much as the things that we're counting. That's sort of nuts. And we're trying to figure out now how to uh, get those external costs internalized. In fact, we're working with the University of Oregon and Oregon State on a project to do a lot of that modeling for the Willamette River Basin. And um, the National Science Foundation is funding the basic science, and then we're going to come in afterwards and fund a policy overlay to sort of show, okay, now that we have all of this data and we kind of know what we're doing, how do we change the laws in ways that might cause the prices that are currently sort of shadow prices to become real prices with impacts in the marketplace? That's a great explanation of a dual focus that you have on building both intellectual foundations for what you're trying to do and then to rally political support for it. Mm -hmm. So your so the Bullet Foundation helps develop the science that is then the the, the posts on which the rest of it can stand, is that right? Uh, to some extent. We we certainly do what we can to encourage substantial <laughs> entities and in particular federal and state governments to underwrite that science. Um, if you were to take our our annual total budget for um, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, British Columbia, and Alaska and pour it into the Willamette Valley, we couldn't begin to fund the science that's going on in this project. That just requires greater resources. But what we have to play with is leverage. And, and we've got flexibility, and we don't have political forces running on us. So the National Science Foundation absolutely has to be purely objective and simply get the best results. And we want to stand on the shoulders of those results and, and try to get them reflected in intelligent policies. Got it. Thank you. I wanted to turn to Earth Day. We have to ask you about <laughs> Earth Day, and I'm sure at some point you will get tired of talking about it, but you are so identified with Earth Day that I'd like to turn the conversation in that direction. We're coming up on the 40th anniversary. Mm -hmm. What kind of changes have you observed since you led that first one in 1970 as a very young man? Um, I, I guess as big as any change is that we now are uh, somewhat more reflective of the reality of the name of the event. Although we called it Earth Day, the stuff that we did in 1970 was all about the United States, and it was mostly about things that are much narrower than that. It's about that smokestack over there belching out this terrible stuff. It's about this effluent pipe that's killing all the fish that are downstream. It's, it's about this new freeway that's going to cut through your neighborhood. And, you know, freeways tend to cut through poor people's neighborhoods. We don't have freeways cutting through uh, Bel Air. So it was an environmental event. It was trying to bring all of these strains from traditional conservation, the, the birds issues, the natural and wildlife issues, and the fish issues, together with lead paint on people's walls and DDT and, and sustainable agriculture and recycling, and pull it all together into a movement that would have far more strength than any of its component parts would, so that we would all work together on a Clean Air Act, and then we would all work together on something else, the Endangered Species Act. And uh, that worked extremely well, but it was nationally focused. And we've made incredible progress in most of the things that we did then. Um, we, we've probably steered in the years since at least 10 to 15 trillion dollars in a direction that it would not have flowed if it hadn't been for laws passed between 1970 and 1973. And because of the way that they were implemented, all of those decisions had to be made in a cost beneficial manner. So this was a, a huge public policy. It's difficult to think of any other movement that has accomplished so much in such a brief period. But the big issues facing us now um, are global issues. They are things like climate disruption, uh, the literally the raping of the the seabeds of the world's oceans and the overfishing of literally every wild fishery in the world, uh, all of which are on the verge of collapse and some have already collapsed, um, and 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 on and on, uh, the the collection of endocrine disrupting chemicals that are now out in every single food chain in the, in the universe, including those that feed into us. 
none of those problems can be solved by any one nation acting by itself. And so what our much more ambitious task is now is to try to, to build a sense of global community, taking advantage of social networking sites and other things to use Earth Day as one vehicle to have people care not just about themselves and their families and their neighbors and their states and their country, but about people. Um, I mean, it is one of the, it, it probably is the last politically acceptable discrimination, the sense that a person that is born one inch on this side of an arbitrary line drawn on a map is worth so much more than a person who was born on the other side of that line on the map. So to return to where you started that very eloquent paragraph, <laughs> Earth Day turned out to be an even more appropriate name for this event and this movement than you had anticipated, perhaps. Yeah. In, in 1990, we just decided to take advantage of the name and see if it would translate elsewhere. And, and it turned out completely inadvertently, because we thought this was going to be a one-time event. We were trying to pull these strands together and launch a movement. But it was like the Poor People's March on Washington or the March on the Pentagon or something. We're going to do it. And but this one just kept on coming year after year after year. All the teachers had it in their lesson plans and did it. When we took, and so we didn't think that much about how this name would play out over time. But when we took it international, it, it turns out that Earth Day translates in a perfectly transparent way into every language that we've encountered. People just intuitively know what you're talking about. And now that you're working with 200 nations, more than 200 nations? No, it'll be give or take 180, 180? 81 maybe. It, it seems all the more prescient on your part, <laughs> I think. You did play with other names, didn't you? There, you were thinking perhaps it would be Environmental Day, or what were some oh, of the other yes, options? You have done some research. <laughs> well, uh, 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 embarrassingly, these were, these were ways to change from being the environmental teach-in, which was how it became into something that would be not having a total focus on college campuses, but dealing with communities as well. And uh, we dealt with an advertising agency to design an ad to uh, be a full page ad in the New York Times, giving it this new impetus. And it was going to be some name colon the beginning and then a bunch of text, but with a name across the top. And yeah, it was um, E-Day, Ecology Day, Environment Day, Green Day, Earth Day. Uh, but it was never much of a contest. Uh, Earth Day just resonated with everyone, and, and it also fit the space requirements very nicely for the ad. It's good and short and punchy and succinct, yeah. I would think that it's going to be really um, encouraging to our students whom you are talking with while you're here on campus to know that you began this when you were a student, or and, uh, at, and it was initially a campus-based idea teach-in. I think it's really um, a powerful incentive to our big thinkers among the student generation to realize what can be done. Are you taking that kind of encouraging line with them to bring mm -hmm. out the activist in this generation? Uh, definitely. For, for historical purposes, I, I need to say that, that Senator Gaylord Nelson was talking about an environmental teach-in for months before I came aboard to ask him whether I might do Harvard's. Um, but um, he then invited me to drop out of Harvard, come down and run the United States. And, uh, and that was an incredible growth experience. And it was a, a remarkable act on his part to get somebody who admittedly had been very politically active at Stanford. But it was a, a big jump to go from a campus to a country. Um, and then it turned out that it was not going to be on a bunch of campuses across the country so much as in cities across the country. I mean, we had a million people in New York City. And it was a, it, I, I have never grown so much in any few months in my life. It must have been a little overwhelming at the time. <laughs> you, you have to learn to be flexible about the things you can't control and focus just upon that number of things that you can control and keep the integrity there. That's an excellent lesson for <laughs> all of us in many endeavors. I wanted to ask you one um, more forward-looking question, which is you've gone on record by saying in another interview that you think the most worrisome environmental problem that we're faced with is human population growth. Is that something you still feel? Mm. Well, uh, you know, environmentalists are sort of bleak and gloomy, and so everybody always asks us about our favorite problem, but <laughs> it's, it's a, a little bit like the obverse of asking, what's your favorite child? Um, if we don't solve the population thing, then we are either going to have an enormous amount of poverty and a, a huge split between the haves and the have-nots. But if, if you're going to have a lifestyle for everyone on the planet that's equivalent to say that in Sweden today, then the planet can only support 
two billion people or so. And we've got six and a half billion now. So yeah, it's a big issue that, that we're able to ignore because we've got billions of people who are not poor in the American sense. They're destitute. They live on, on $100 a day, uh, $100 a, a year. Um, I, I sometimes ask this question of kids, where's the worst air pollution in the world? And they come up with Mexico City and Shanghai. And it's not. It, the worst air pollution in the world is in a peasant's hut with no chimney, not even a hole in the roof, burning dung to keep themselves warm. I mean, I've spent a couple of hours in such huts, and I feel like I lose a year off of my life every hour I'm in there. This can't continue, and uh, the only way that we can get around it is by having population within levels that we can afford to maintain in an affluent fashion. I'd like to end on a hopeful note. Is I thought there? that was a hopeful note. Okay, I'd like to end <laughs> on an even more hopeful note. Yeah. How's that? What hope do we have for the future then with this 40th anniversary of Earth Day coming on? It's an optimistic thing to do to run this event for 40 years. How do you see the immediate future? Um, well, we, we have come to tipping points of various kinds before, and I, th I think we are now coming to one on climate disruption. Um, and with regard to carbon fuels in particular, I think due to um, problems that the coal industry has over and beyond greenhouse warming with mountaintop mining and black lung and lung disasters, and um, that oil has because it's mostly concentrated in the Middle East and what have you, that, that now we have a president who seems to understand this a terrific head of the EPA, a terrific head of the Department of Energy, just excellent people scattered, wonderful presidential science advisor. Uh, and if we can get some support out of Congress, I think we're going to tilt it and start moving aggressively toward that energy aspect that we were talking about earlier in the debate of, of how do you get to the post-industrial, post-carbon era. And for me, that's super efficient, using the brightest, bravest new technologies we have and fulfilling their needs from renewable sources. That's a great place to stop. Thank you so much for coming and taking the time to talk to me. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Our guest today has been Dennis Hayes, President and CEO of the Bullet Foundation. He was the National Coordinator of the First Earth Day in 1970. Hayes gave a talk entitled, Is Prosperity Incompatible with Posterity? on February 24, 2010, as the Oregon Humanities Center 2009-2010 Robert D. Clark Lecturer in the Humanities. Thank you for watching.